Right, uh, the next question is for Mark, and that's about Pures. The question is, what do you really think about Pures? So, tricky question. Um, Pures are a big part of our game and are naturally a result of the way that our combat calculator works. So, your defense skill naturally has impact on your combat level, and as you raise your defense level, your combat level increases. So I'm, I'm going to talk about um, defense pures to start with here. If you think about it, it's kind of our mistake, because what we didn't do was we didn't give enough benefit for the defense skill, as opposed to the detriment that it gave you when it effectively made you raise your combat level. In the wilderness, obviously, depending on where you are in the wilderness, there is a range of levels that can attack you. And if you've got hardly any defense level, but your but your combat skill, but your other combat skills are maxed, and you've got access to prayers, and our defense, our protection from prayers are particularly powerful, uh, you know, compared to the defense skill, then it's obviously in your advantage to have a low defense level. Now, what I'm going to to do all the time, and it, this relates back to the answer that I gave earlier, because we're a classless system, we're encouraging you to do anything you want at all times, you know, you can train anything you want, it, it, it doesn't make any difference. So if I've got part of my game that you don't want to train because you feel that it's going to be a negative impact on your combat level, then it's my job as a designer to find ways to encourage you to train that skill. So it's not, an, you know, a, def a defense update isn't anti-pure, it's pro-defense skill. So I want you to go and try as many different pieces of content as possible. That includes the defense skill. So if I do an update that requires a defense level and ends up giving you a strength benefit from it, I'm not anti-pures, I'm pro-defense. And that also works with skill pures and all sorts of different pures. It's your choice when you're saying, right, I, I don't want to level these skills at all. I want to, I, as a designer, I want to encourage you to level those skills. That doesn't mean I hate pures. We like pures. We like the fact that people want to tailor their accounts in certain ways. We want to encourage, you know, we want to help people to do those things. But I don't want a piece of content in the game where you're encouraged not to train it. And some people would say that that is exactly what the defense skill is. I will continue to try and make updates to the defense skill, but it's not anti-pure. It's pro-defense, and, and that's the answer. Thanks, Mark. Okay, the uh, next question is in regards to the Grand Exchange, and that's uh, starting with Andrew and over to Fetsky. And the question is uh, simply, how does the GE work? Um, well, I won't give out the exact formula, because that's, that's top secret, and you know, I'm sure there's a lot of uh, price manipulators who'd love to know. So we keep that guarded in a safe, just guarded by three trolls, a unicorn, a dragon. Not going to tell you that, but I will tell you roughly you know, the basic principles that the Grand Exchange <laughs> operates upon. Um, I mean, broadly speaking, it runs according to the laws of supply and demand. Um, you know, if an item is in greater supply than the demand, then the price goes one way, and if the demand exceeds the supply, then the price goes the other way. And we've tried as hard as possible to make it reflect what the players themselves are doing in the game. Um, our question we often asked is, you know, do we manipulate the prices? Do we change the prices? Um, none of them have... Actually, they've already asked that, haven't you? Um, none of the prices are fixed at a particular value. Um, we do occasionally intervene to correct a price, um, but only when we feel that it's been manipulated away from what actually most people want it to do. Most of the time it's going up and down. And obviously, as you know, there's price caps, but we've been doing a huge amount of work to eliminate those, and there's nothing like as many capped prices anymore. Uh, the other thing we get asked is, do you generate items on the Grand Exchange? Am I actually really trading with another player? Are you taking items in there the game? Absolutely not. We never do that. They are all, well, every single trade is balanced against another player. Eski? Yeah, the, the uh, second part of the question is, so how much, how do we do the deal with prices for new items? So, um, there's two ways to do it. One is like, you know, a finger up in the air and say, like, it should be about, I don't know, twice as uh, expensive as the other one. And the other one goes through a lot of work going to look at, like, who will be, uh, who will be looking into buying these items. So, for instance, if we look at the Frost Dragon Bones, the, the last big um, item that we released at quite a controversial price at about 20k, uh, it really was like, who's going to train with that? because it's going to be expensive. Who's going to supply that? Because there's not many people with level 85 Dungeoneering, I believe. Um, there's, um, so there's going to be a limited supply, there's going to be a limited demand. Who's going to buy it? Who, how much money do these people who 
are potentially buying it, uh, having how much can they generate, so when they make a rational choice, what will they go for? And then again, when we have the result, we look at it with the gut feeling again and say, like, you know, from that one, does it fit right? Because sometimes you really get it all right in a mathematical sense, but in the end, the gut feeling just says, nah, this is wrong. And with the frost bones, uh, frost dragon bones, I think we got it exactly right. I just looked at the, um, at the graph in the six weeks since the launch, and yes, we had a little skyrocket, we had a little trough, as we always have with new items, you know, demand rises and then supply rises, and now it is actually um, leveling around the price that we had on release, and that is one of the first times that we got it that spot on, so we're quite proud of that. Thank you. Right, the uh, next question uh, is from a player named The Eggman, and uh, it's about the mysterious Falador rocks. Um, the question is uh, for Joe and Mark, and uh, goes, uh, ever since I started playing RuneScape, I've always wanted to know about the mysterious rocks north of Falador. The ones I'm referring to are the ones which have the elemental symbols on them. Uh, what are they, and uh, will they lead to some epic quest? I'm actually really glad someone asked this question. Um, it's probably about five or six years ago that we did a improvement um, of the, the Falador area. And I remember, um, I, I think I, I was working on the modeling at the time, I was working with another modeler, and I said, basically, just take this rock pile and, and improve it. And he was like, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Um, and I said, you know, go, go crazy with it. It's, it's just rocks, you know, you can use your imagination. It's like, okay, well, what I'll do, I'll, um, I'll put some symbols on it. It's, it's really quite straightforward. But uh, as well as that, if you look at the rocks uh, top down, they're actually uh, a star constellation, which obviously you didn't think anyone else would ever get. So the fact that someone has actually kind of picked up on the fact that they're slightly more mysterious, I think is, is quite nice. Um, I was going to say to you today, if you can you know, actually guess which constellation it is, uh, because yesterday we couldn't remember, and we had to do a bit of research, um, then you know, uh, email in and you know, give you a prize. But uh, unfortunately, I think it might have changed. Like, I think it originally was the Andromeda galaxy. So. Um, that's, uh, that's why the rocks are, are there. And it's interesting, um, it's often the case that we'll specifically leave gaps for storylines in the future. And al although we think ahead and we're trying to work out where our storylines are going to be in a year, two, three years time, there's always the odd quest that, you know, we just suddenly come up with a cool idea that we want to put in the game. And we'll often deliberately leave gaps for new content to kind of fit in. Uh, when we launched the Grand Exchange, there was a trapdoor, for example, that was on the side, and that didn't work for a long time. We knew that we had uh, plans in the future to link the Grand Exchange to dwarves and all sorts of things like that, um, and so eventually we found a use of the trapdoor. But when we released it originally, it didn't function at all. So there you go. Thank you, Mark. Okay, uh, the next question is uh, another one for Andrew. Uh, it's about uh, bots and macros. And the uh, question is, why aren't you doing anything about bots? Um, to which I would reply, uh, we absolutely are doing things about bots. Um, in fact, the amount of time we spend combating bots is quite, quite horrible, actually. I mean, you know, we spend an awful lot of resource on them. It's, it's a shame that we have to waste so much time doing that, but obviously we do. Um, we've just launched a new detection system literally in the last couple of weeks which massively improves our ability to detect bots, gives us all sorts of extra ways of being able to detect them. I mean, we were able to detect them previously, but we're now able to detect them with less sort of human intervention, if you like, which means we can work through, work through it even quicker. Um, there's definitely going to be another mass ban coming. Um, um, I mean, this time around it's going to hurt right? because people are generally botting on their mains because of the trade restrictions, so they're a bit daft, if you ask me. Um, but yeah, we're not going to stop. We've got countless ways of detecting them. They're, they're nowhere near, even close to undetectable, so they're for a real shock. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, uh, the next question uh, is about merchanting clans and the uh, questions, what are your thoughts on merchanting clans? Uh, Mark, could you tell us what a merchanting clan is? So, I think it's an imp really important to establish the difference between a merchant, someone who buys an item for a low price and chooses to sell that for a higher price, and what a lot of people are currently looking at and calling merchanting clans. Um, there are a lot of clans which will deliberately manipulate the market to force the price of an item to skyrocket. 
Those are the things that we don't like. We don't want uh, a, a large group of people deliberately manipulating the price of objects. But we've got absolutely nothing against someone who's buying an object at a low price and selling it at a high price. And there's a big difference between those two things. So it's important to establish that merchanting is absolutely fine in terms of buying an object low and selling an object for a high price, unless you are deliberately manipulating the price to make it go higher. So, Christoph, do you want to talk a bit about, more about merchanting? Yes, uh, because, of course, uh, a true merchanting clan can actually help us players who can't be bothered to go out and get all these things. Because, I mean, if a mer true merchanting clan looks at the prices and sees the lack of supply somewhere and says, right, this is where we can make a fast buck. And that is the kind of stuff that I like, because I like to go to the Grand Exchange and get the stuff immediately and really not wait and not know, like, okay, there's no supply for this or something like that. So we want, uh, I do want a true merchanting clan to operate so that, that there always is a healthy supply for all the items on there. But of course, as Mark said, when people are generating a lack of supply, when they are deliberately choosing not to put anything up or to control the market, monopolize the market, that's when we need to get active. And that's where we are increasingly getting active. Um, we are getting much better at monitor, monitoring the Grand Exchange and getting more and more um, active towards banning people or preventing them. Uh, from monopolizing the Grand Exchange in other ways. So, yes, we, we're not making that much fuss about it on the forums as we perhaps should, but be assured we are looking very closely at the Grand Exchange on a daily, on an hourly basis. Thank you. Right, uh, the next question is uh, quite, quite a big one. Um, this is for Andrew, and it's, uh, are you planning RuneScape 3? Um, no, we're not planning RuneScape 3. Uh, we think all the improvements we want to make to the game, and there's a lot of improvements we want to make to the game, we can actually make in the context of the current game. Uh, these days, we tend to make our improvements via incremental changes, some which are pretty massive. I mean, if you look at the difference between RuneScape 2 now and RuneScape 2 when it launched, they're very different games. Um, you know, RuneScape HD, for example, practically was RuneScape 3, but, but we just did it as an incremental improvement. Um, we are, however, planning a new fantasy MMO, which you know, has been alluded to a few times in the past, but that wouldn't be a RuneScape 3. That wouldn't be a replacement for RuneScape. RuneScape we're planning on running for, you know, many years to come. It, all of our, you know, strategy documents, it goes all, as far into the future as all of our documents get. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Andrew. And just to let you know, that question came from Rainbow King 5. Uh, the next one's for Mark, um, and this is came from Moe's 4210, and that's about skills above 99. Uh, the question is, uh, what's your stance on skills going above 99? And he goes on to say, please stop these rumours once and for all. So, as you know, we have the facility for skills to go up to 120, Dungeoneering goes up to 120. There are absolutely no plans to raise any other skill above level 99. It is something that we could do if we wanted to, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but there are no plans right now, no plans in the future or any of the documents that we've written to raise the uh, to skills above 99. A lot of people will say I need more um, I need more life points to be able to deal with the rate of damage that, I'm, that we're dealing with, but I don't think the answer would be to raise you know, above 99 uh, on your constitution. There's, that, that wouldn't really help because it would only uh, benefit absurdly high level players. I, I'd rather fix the problem in a different way. So, answer is no, we're not planning to raise other skills above 99. Thank you. Uh, 